Assalamu alaikum. Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. So uh, when I uh, was asked to present on this topic, um, Dr. Sammy asked me to um, send a description, and I sent one, which is about three sentences, and he said, you have to write more. And I said, well, uh, this is a pretty basic topic, because uh, they have to talk about the future, I have to just talk about the past, which is easy to do, it's just descriptive, right? And um, when you talk about the role, you know, the, the structure of pre-modern Islamic civilization or the role of the Sharia in pre-modern Islam, well, this is just like the classes I teach. So I figured, I realized too late I could bring pictures and do a, my PowerPoint show like I do with my class, but all those pictures, pictures are from Turkey anyway, so most of you probably have seen them. So I figured it's not a big loss. So anyway. We talk about pre-modern Islamic civilization. Obviously, you're talking about tremendous diversity, tremendous diversity over uh, 1,400 years, um, geographical expanse from West Africa to Southeast Asia, from the steppes of Russia to the islands of the Indian Ocean. But um, <clears throat> there's a, a pretty consistent system which was described by the great uh, Chicago historian Marshall Hodgson as the Emir Ayan system, the Emir Ayan system, which was that uh, basically society was run by um, partnership between the Emirs, basically military, military dynasties, um, Turkic warlords or uh, Persian warlords or some kind of um, strong man. And um, they would provide for the basic security of the borders and uh, basic law and order. and. Uh, the rest of society was run by the elite, by the ayan, the elites. And the elites consisted of um, the ulama, uh, merchants, landholders, rural notables, um, descendants of the Prophet, alayhi salatu salam, um, uh, Sufi uh, leaders. Right? So these were, the, these were the people who actually ran and supervised the majority of, of what we would now call state functions. And the, the emirs, the actual rulers, Wali al-Amr or the Hakim, were, had a you know, very minor role compared to the, the modern nation state. This is stuff that uh, Awamer loves to talk about and is, is frequently brought up today in discussions of the difference between uh, modern Muslim states or visions of the modern Muslim state and the pre-modern Muslim state, which is the, the pre-modern state not just for Muslims, for everybody, was a very, very small and limited phenomenon. It didn't uh, really regulate very much of people's lives. It didn't really control very much of people's lives. It oftentimes had very limited geographical reach, either outside the capital cities or outside the great cities of, uh, of, a, of a state, um, because it's, these states simply did not have the technology and the capacity and the manpower and the administrative um, ability to really reach into people's lives. And there's a, if you're interested in, in this in the Ottoman context, there's a famous story of the slave girl of Pergamon. Has anyone ever heard this? No one, not, well, not even uh, Saleh, you haven't heard this? You haven't heard this one from Cornell Fleischer? So basically there's this, uh, so Suleiman the Magnificent, Rahimahullah, he said, you know, I guarantee that, uh, I guarantee justice in my, and, and peace in, in my kingdom. And then this one, uh, a young lady says, oh, I'm going to prove this, and she walks from Pergamon, she tries to walk to some other city, and of course she's attacked and, and, and robbed and everything like that. And she goes and asks for justice from the ruler. But the point is that he's really, these uh, states are really not able to, um, even if you look you know, in, in the geographical, the, the boundaries of a map of the Ottoman Empire in the 1600s, these states were simply not able to really um, permeate everything that's colored uh, on the map today. Um, it was uh, really the, the institutions of life, of law, of, um, of, of civil society were all provided by this elite or overseen by this elite, the ayan. Of course, the, mo the most influential and pervasive were the ulama, the religious scholars. Okay, so the system that uh, permeated this, these societies and defined them and structured them was the sharia, the sharia. And uh, it was articulated by the ulama, it was applied by the ulama as judges, as market inspectors, and um, it was upheld by all the elites of these, of these societies. Although it's very interesting, <clears throat> by the way, you know, I don't know if uh, my fellow panelists agree with me, but in, in my experience, the, 
the word sharia doesn't actually come up a lot in sources. You more often see the word shara, just shara, which means the law. It's the same thing as the Sharia, but I think it, it, it sort of illustrates the omnipresence and the absolutely central role that this, that this the Sharia had in the system, which was they didn't have to say it was sort of God's law or the sacred law. In any sense. It was just the law. It was the only law. It was assumed to be there and it was assumed to be the basis of people's lives. So what was the function of this law? Um, <clears throat> so I'll start with three functions, and these are all, these are all actually overseen by the elites, the ayan. Uh, most notably the ulama. First of all, of course, like any legal system, the Sharia provided framework for dispute resolution um, between private parties. So if I go and I kick you in the, the shin really hard, or I break a contract with you, or I call you a nasty name or something like that, or I try and take over your house, we're going to have some uh, uh, place where we can go to settle our dispute. And here you see that just normal areas of law, of like property, contracts, what we'd call torts in um, common law or injuries. And these, of course, are uh, the, the rules uh, for these issues or the, to, to give answers to these questions are, were derived from the Quran, the Sunnah of the Prophet, the, the, the rulings of early Muslim community and uh, different types of legal reasoning. And of course, very importantly, also from custom. A lot of the details of Islamic law come from custom, because uh, you know when you what is an acceptable agreement in a contract? What's the appropriate mahar you pay? Uh, what uh, you know when do we know that we a contract is finished? What do we have to do to say that a contract is agreed upon? These things are all defined by custom, and this was acknowledged by the ulama as being absolutely essential to understand the law. Uh, second function um, that the Sharia provided was uh, that of a social economic infrastructure. So the actual infrastructure of life in Islamic civilization, in fact, one could say that what defines Islamic civilization is this infrastructure, things like madrasa, madrasas, um, schools, right? Things like waqf, the fact that in, if you lived in, in Istanbul in 1600 or Bursa in 1600, your whole life from the time you were born to the time you died was, could be lived through interactions with Al-Qaf as hospitals, as places for poor people, as places for, you know, Ibn Battuta, if you ever want to read a fascinating description of this, he talks about the Al-Qaf in Damascus in the 1300s. There's a walk for, for uh, servants who've broken their dishes They've been sent to do an errand. They break the dish on the errand, and they're afraid to go back to their uh, master so they can go to the waqf and get a replacement dish. There's a waqf for injured animals. So the animals can go and stay at this waqf when they get fed hay and stuff and live a happy life until they die instead of being put, at, you know, put to sleep or something like that. So I'll call for everything, for uh, hospitals, uh, soup kitchens, um, and of course, very important, khans or caravan sarais. So you can see these in, in Bursa or any other city of, in, in in, um, in Turkey, even in Safran Bolu. I took pictures of the Khan there. I used to show it to my students. So the places where uh, merchants could have their wares protected, they could sleep overnight happily like a hotel, and then used to sell their wares the next day. Um, and it's important that, this isn't always true, but in general in Islamic civilization, uh, this infrastructure was often provided by the state in the sense that it was provided by members of the ruling class, these emirs, but those emirs provided them in their capacity as private individuals. So when you go and you see the different mosques in Istanbul, they're not called you know, Ottoman Mosque number one, Ottoman State Mosque number two. It's the, the jami of the you know, Atik Vali Sultan jami, or you know, Shehzad uh, jami, or Suleiman the Magnificent jami. These are, or the Rustem Pasha jami, or Sokulu Mohammed Pasha jami. These are, pri these are individuals who happen to be in the, the organs of the state, but who are providing this infrastructure in their capacity as wealthy private individuals. Of course, later on, as you get into the, especially the later part of the Ottoman Empire, you start seeing more uh, direct state provision. Okay, uh, and f uh, five minutes? No, no, you're good here. Okay. Keep going. I'm so sensitive to time uh. that, and of course, the third, so the third function provided by the elite, by this, the ayan, is the moral order, the moral order. Uh, this is, of course, maybe more important than legal order, you know, if we're, if we're lucky, none of us will end up in court. 
Um, you know, hopefully if you live a conflict-free life, you don't ever have to go in court in your life, but you're, def you're always making moral decisions. You're always getting into moral disagreements and conflicts with people. How do we know what these, moral, these rules are for dis resolving disputes? These also come from, or they're certainly influenced by the Sharia, which would, and I just came up with these two terms thinking about it, you know, uh, in one sense there's taqwa, right, which is that you have a moral relationship between you and God, and that you express this through ibadah, through worship, you express this through um, akhlaq or uh, ethics in which you have God consciousness in mind. But the second very important source for this moral order, which was a Sharia legitimate source, was maru'a, maru'a or virtue, which was acknowledged by the ulama to come from custom. So what is maru'a? It is a takhalluq bil amthali fil, fil makani wa zaman. Uh, Muru'a is you act like other people like you in your society are supposed to act. So if it's, if it's aib to smoke in the marketplace, you don't smoke in the marketplace. If it's aib to eat in the street, you don't eat in the street. If it's aib not to shout when, and sing some song when your soccer team wins, well, you better shout and sing a song when your soccer team wins. Otherwise, you're not going to have muru'a um, virtue. Okay, so those are the three functions that are provided by the Sharia, which are really... Um, articulated and overseen and implemented, at least in, their, in the first instance, by these elite, especially the ulama. But then you have the uh, three more functions which are done by the ruler, by the wali al-amr or the hakim or the, the, uh, the sultan. Um, and these are first the protection of public order. By the way, these three you could roughly put under the, the category of siyasa. Siyasa meaning politics, governance, uh, executive authority, imperium, if you want to think in the, the Latin sense, the ability, the right to command and the right to punish those who disobey you, imperium. First, pr protection of public order or, and, and, and the borders of the state, dabt al bayda, as, uh, as the Arabic term is. So protection of public order, making sure that someone can walk the streets or travel um, inside a city or outside a city and be safe. Uh, second, very interestingly, managing the relationship with non-Muslim minorities. Uh, the reason why you, you, you know, you do see discussions about this in fiqh books, the ahkam of the Ahl al but a lot of times by the time you, you get to like the Mamluk period and you're reading uh, fatwa manuals, a lot of times they'll say, ultimately, dealing with non-Muslims is going to go to the hakim. What does the ruler say? He's the one who's going to decide how, you know, does the church get built or not? Does the synagogue get repaired or not? What about the, the Christian merchants from Italy who are upset that they didn't get their paid the right amount of money? It's going to be the, the, the ruler who deals with these uh, non-Muslim minorities, either internal or from outside. And finally, perhaps most importantly, the job of the ruler is to be the final guarantor of justice the final guarantor of justice, the provider and protector of justice in the realm. Uh, this comes from the, you could say this comes from the pre-Islamic Near Eastern tradition of, 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 the, of the Roman and Persian worlds, but uh, it's also um, very much an, an Arabian and Islamic tradition that, you know, ultimately you can go to the Khalifa or you can go to the Sheikh and say, you know, something has happened to me and it's not right and that that person's job is to try and provide justice, and that that's the, one of the markers of a good ruler, is to provide that justice. And um, this is why, if, you know, you read historical chronicles of you know, various Muslim dynasties throughout Islamic civilization, um, rulers who are praised are always praised for two things. They're praised for, first, raf al madhalim They removed wrongs. They removed injustices. They provided justice. They removed injustice. They provided justice. And the second thing is iqamat hudud Allah. They established the boundaries of God. They established the hudud. Now, um, this is kind of a tricky concept because, you know, um, a lot of times Muslims are pressed on this issue of hudud and, you know, the, ac the, the very entirely accurate thing to say is that these hadood were almost never actually implemented. Uh, we've, a number of scholars have written on that, and uh, uh, you know, if you're interested in it, I wrote something called Stone 
stoning and hand cutting in Islam or something like that has lots of good statistics in it. But I mean, for example, in the Ottoman Empire, in Istanbul, from the time that Istanbul was conquered in 1453 until 1920, there's only one or two cases of someone being ex executed for zina. Now, there was probably more zina than that, okay? But, and people got caught for it. But the duty of the Muslim scholars, as judges, their duty from the mouth of the Prophet ﷺ was right? Ward off the hudud from the believers by any uh, ambiguities you can find. So it's, it's sort of an, a difficult issue to explain, and a, a bit ironic that uh, the very thing that rulers are praised for, Iqamat Hududullah, is also the thing that the ulama as judges were trying so hard never to actually allow to happen. And there's one case in the, 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 the early 1500s, actually under the Mamluk Sultan Kansu al Ghuri, where he discovers a, a case of zina. And he gets so, so excited, he gets, I'm going to get to stone somebody. You know, he says, I'm going to be able to do hudud Allah. And you can see he's really happy because I'm gonna, people are going to write about me the way like all these other great rulers are written. Of course, the ulama said, no, 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 absolutely not. You can't do this. And in fact, they insisted so much that they, the couple not be punished because they, they didn't, uh, they recanted their, they recanted their uh, confession. That the, the judge who, he actually accepted being fired and being exiled. His whole family had to leave Egypt rather than actually sign off on the ruling. So this is a, the, 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 the commitment of these ulama to following the command of the Prophet to ward off the hudud punishments. But, so you have something where uh, s rulers are praised for removing injustices and prov uh, establishing the, the hudud of God, even though those hudud don't really actually in reality get ex uh, established. But it's what, I think it's, what's important is what they stand for. So in um, these two things, Raf al Madala, removing injustices and establishing the hudud of God, you have the two great values of pre Islamic or pre uh, modern Islamic civilization. Uh, with removing injustices, you have the notion that the job of the government and the job of society and the state is to remove injustice, provide justice, remove injustice in people's lives. And the second um, thing, which is at least symbolically achieved by the comment Hadud Allah, is orienting the society towards God. The society is supposed to be oriented towards God. Um, and these are uh, two, um, as I said, the two main kind of objectives of the pre-modern Islamic state, and uh, something that Muslim states achieved despite, uh, you know, the very limited technologies and. Uh, you know, administrative capacities they had uh, in the pre-modern period. Thanks very much. Oh. Yeah, sure.